want to thank all of you for joining today. My name is Jennifer Morris. I'm with Madcap Software. And today it is my great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Meinrad Reiterer, Productions Manager for Mad Translations. Now, Meinrad happens to be based in the heart of Europe, in, in beautiful Austria to be exact. And he's been in the translation business since 1993. And as the Production Manager for Mad Translations, he gets to live his passion for language and technology every single day. And together with his very talented team, he is always looking for new and smarter ways to implement and streamline the translation process. And that is what our, is going to be our focus uh, today. So Meinrad's going to share insights on what happens or better yet, what should happen when you send your Flare project off for translation and what you can do to help your translation vendor deliver fully functional, correctly translated flare projects. So welcome, Meinrad. I'm so happy you're with us today. Now, we do have a lot to cover, and I just have a couple of housekeeping items that we always do right before we begin. And so you'll see on the next slide, we've got, I got two things I want to mention quickly. As always, we will be recording this webinar and we'll be emailing everybody who signed up a link. So if you have to jump off early, that's okay. We'll, we'll get you the recording as soon as it's done. There's also an area in the GoToWebinar console to ask questions. We would encourage you to ask any questions that come up during the presentation. We're going to get to what we can at the end and whatever we don't get to, we'll send a follow-up uh, question and answer document to everybody that signed up. So with that, again, once again, welcome, Myrad. I'm so happy you're with us today. I know you've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Jen, for this very nice introduction. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to all of you. It's, as Jen said, I'm over here in Austria. It's already dark outside. Uh, you guys, most of you guys are just probably beginning the day. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Well, as you all know, Madcap Flare is a very powerful authoring tool that offers tons of features and possibilities for creating extremely sophisticated output. And you all probably had this experience that while you got to know Flare better and better, you started using more and more of those nice tools and features and your projects became more and more complex. In all those years that we have been translating Flare projects for our customers, um, it's been really breathtaking to see what people are doing with this tool. We've translated hundreds of Flare projects from organizations with various backgrounds, from life science, machine builders, software companies, and government agencies. And we have dealt with complex projects with literally thousands of topics, hundreds of conditions, and tons of variables. Maybe all of them even linked to a global project. While creating such impressive documentation projects in Flare is definitely a lot of fun, Translating these projects can be really intimidating for translators and language service providers. The thing is, while you as the author of your project know every little detail about all the topics, conditions, and variables, and links, and CSS files, and whatnot, the translator probably doesn't. In fact, the majority of translators know very little, if anything at all, about Flare projects and what they can look like and how they function. And Indeed, apart from the specialties that a Flare project can contain, every single Flare project can be different. Well, yes, you do have a certain structure in the Flare project, as well as a defined set of files, but even the structure can vary, let alone all the pretty nitty details, such as conditions, text in CSS files, or page layout files, and so on. So when you need to have your Flare project translated, what is it that you as the author can do to help make the translation process as smooth as possible and to increase your chances of getting back a fully functional, completely translated Flare project in the requested target languages? There's indeed a lot that can be done on your part, and this is what we're going to talk about in these next uh, 40 to 45 minutes. Here's a little preview of the topics that we're going to cover. Number one, this is the absolutely most important thing that I want you to take away from this webinar, but I won't talk about it until the very end of this presentation and you will see why. Um, number two, technical correctness of your Flare project. Why is this important? Number three, structure of a Flare project. What files need to be translated and where are those files? Number four, Snippets, variables, and conditions. What are they and why should you be really careful using them? Number five, special formatting. We're going to look at some problems that can occur, especially in PDF output. 
We are going to talk about the best way to prepare graphics with text for translation. And what can you do or what should you do when your documentation describes a software and contains references to the UI? So since I won't talk about the most important thing until the end of this presentation, let's jump right into number two on this list. Technical correctness of your Flare project. And why is this important? Well, imagine you need your Flare project translated into nine different languages. It's just like putting a sheet of paper into a copy machine. Each of the resulting projects will be an identical copy of your original Flare project only with the content written in a different language. But every missing or broken link, every broken reference, every missing topic, every tag error, every wrong formatting will be carried over to each of the new projects. This means that instead of fixing an error once, you now need to fix it 10 times. And that's why before we start working on any Flare project, we first run a project analysis on the source project and we build the targets that are required for translation. We do this to make sure we actually have all the files that we need. For example, that there are no files missing that we need to build the targets, which can happen because maybe the author has saved it, has saved some files on a different network path that was not included when the Flare project was zipped, or because some references point to a global project, which we do not have. And we do this to make sure that the source project contains no errors that would cause problems when building the output. So before sending your project off for translation, make sure it is free of any technical errors and the package that you create for the translation vendor contains all the necessary files and folders. So that's pretty obvious. Um, but as you know, a Flare project can be anything from very simple to very complex. And the basic structure is pretty much always the same, but every author can choose to put files into different folders. Usually the folder structure in the project organizer is a given, but where you put your images and snippets or other elements is more or less up to you and can vary from project to project. So it's very important for the translator to know what files will or can contain translatable text and where these files actually are. Now, if you or your translator use Madcap Lingo, you don't need to worry about that because Lingo knows exactly which files are needed for translation. Without Lingo, however, it can be a bit tricky to get all the required files, especially when you have a complex project and only need certain targets or certain text with certain conditions translated. Here is a nice table of files that shows what file types you may find in a Flare project and what content they may contain. In addition to the obvious topic files and snippets, we may have glossaries, table of contents files, master page and page layout files, and so on. It's quite often, and this is important to remember, quite often uh, translatable text can also be contained in the CSS file or in one of the CSS files if the project contains several of them, as well as in the master pages and page layouts. So it might be good that you get a good knowledge of these files and their potential translatable content and that you communicate that to your translators. Well, now we are getting to the real fun part. We're going to talk about snippets, variables, and conditions. These elements are a huge help for creating elegant, useful, single source publishing projects. Many authors like using these features, and the better they get to know Flare, the more they use them. However, it's very easy to overdo it with them, and this is where it can get really tricky and complicated during translation. Let's first start with snippets. Snippets are important files used for single sourcing that act like a mini topic. There's no limit to what you can pack into a snippet, and there's actually only one thing that you should avoid. Do not use snippets in partial sentences. In one of the projects that we recently worked on, the author created a very complex structure with one global project that had lots of snippets. One table contained a description of possible error messages, and there was one error message which could, could appear many times. 
And the error message was always the same, only the data element that led to this message would differ. Um, here is uh, the sentence so that you can understand what I mean. The sentence read, the error occurs if, and then a certain data element is populated, but source is empty or null. So the customer created two snippets in order to create these sentences with all the different data elements. Um, in snippet one, he put the error occurs if, so the first sentence, the first part of the sentence. And in snippet two, he put the second part of the sentence. It's populated, but source is empty or null. So the data element was inserted as a variable. Um, so the sentence, the complete sentence looked like this, snippet one, and then the variable, and then snippet two. This is nice in the source project, but it really creates problems in translation. Actually, two main problems. Number one, the translator only sees each part of the sentence separately. And these parts probably won't appear to the translator in a way that he or she recognizes them as belonging together because both snippets are just uh, two, two files among a long list of other files. So the translator has no clue, especially in the second part of the sentence about what it refers to and how it should be translated correctly. In, and the second problem is that in some languages, the grammatical structure or the order of the snippets needs to be changed. And this is something that the translator cannot do at all in, in their CAT tool. So you can probably imagine how difficult it is for a translator to figure out what's going on here and how to translate those segments correctly. Now let's talk about variables. Variables, as you probably all know, are brief non-formatted pieces of content, such as the name of your company's product or a phone number. That, and this, this uh, piece of content can be edited in one place, but it can be reused in many places throughout your project. Variables are especially well suited for text that might change frequently, such as version numbers or dates. They're usually stored in variable sets, which can hold multiple variables. Now, what we often see is that people use variables for a lot of different purposes. And believe me, some people are re getting really creative here. For example, by putting text into variables that can cause real issues in translations. The problem with that is that in many languages, nouns must be grammatically adjusted to the specific structure of the sentence, or that the surrounding text must be adjusted to the noun used in the variable. Here's an example of what I mean. Um, we recently had this sentence in, in one of our projects. Uh, the sentence read, um, the, the complete sentence itself was defined as a variable, and the variable itself contained two other variables, namely the global product name variable and the global doc type variable. In the final document, this sentence could either read, welcome to the ACME manual, or welcome to the ACME online help. But what the translator sees is just this. This is all that the translator sees. So when compiling one of the targets, the correct German translation must either be willkommen zum ACME Handbuch or willkommen zur ACME Online Hilfe. The translator has no way of entering a translation that would be that would fit both uh, scenarios actually. And if you an English native speaker and you don't know German, then this difference between zum and zur might look like a very little difference but for german speaking people it's 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 like crazy when you when they hear a sentence like will comment to online hilfe that's just it just doesn't work here's another thing that can make the use of variables dangerous in translations let's say you have 
this sentence in your topic. Um, the variable, there's a variable in there, should be plugged in and then turn it on. And let's say that the variable is originally defined as holding the word device so that the actual English sentence reads, the device should be plugged in and then turn it on. So the German translation for this sentence would be, schalten Sie das Gerät an und schalten Sie es anschließend ein. So you see the red words, those are the words that really cause problems. Um, so this is all fine, but now let's say that in the next version of your Flare project, you decide to replace the content of the variable with machine, so that the final sentence reads, the machine should be plugged in, and then turn it on. Now, for the translation memory and for the translator, not much seems to have changed. The translation memory will probably give you a 99% match, and the translator will probably confirm that match, since he or she doesn't see much of a difference, because in the CAP tool, the translator only sees the tag, but usually not the content of the tag. However, in the second case, the correct German sentence must now read, schließen Sie die Maschine an und schalten Sie sie anschließend ein. So you see the articles must change. And the same is true for many other languages. And you never know what problems you run into with different variables and different languages. So to be on the safe side in translations, refrain from using common nouns in variables as much as possible. Well, having said that, I should add that there is a way to avoid those problems when you use Madcap Lingo. When setting up a project in Lingo, you can tell Lingo to flatten either certain or all variables, and to convert sub-segment snippets to text. This means that instead of a tag, the real text shows up in Lingo and can be translated and grammatically adjusted according to the requirements of the target language. And this is indeed a nice thing, but when you do that, you should not forget to select the very same settings when you set up a new project for the same Flare project because otherwise you will lose a number of hits from the translation memory. And in addition, you should be aware of the fact that when you flatten variables in Lingo, your translated Flare project will not contain these variables anymore, but instead the real text. Now, let's take a look at some granted extreme examples from some real world, pro real world projects. Um, this is a topic from a project that we recently worked on. As you can see, this author is using a lot of variables, snippets, and conditions. But for now, let us just focus on one particular sentence, this one. In this sentence alone, we have one term in a span tag, another term in a span tag with a condition, then another span tag without conditions, a variable with a condition, a drop-down variable, and a text field variable. Now, depending on the selected conditions in Flare, the resulting sentence may look like this, meaning select my company's entity ID bracket type slash value bracket from the drop-down menu, or it can look like this, select my company ID from the drop-down. But what does the translator in a CAT tool see? Depending on whether the translator works with Lingo and has the variables flattened or not, or in another tool, he or she might either see this or this. Now imagine you are a translator translating into a language that is grammatically different from English, which actually most languages are. Um, you can see that this is a real tough task for any translator to A, figure out what's actually happening here in this sentence, for example, and B, 
find the correct translation so that the translated text will display correctly for each output. In some languages, this might be possible, but I would think in most languages not. So here, for example, is the result of the German translation um, as we received it back from our translator. And in this case, when the correct condition is selected for the output, like up here, the, uh, the future target, uh, the German translation displays correctly. It says, wählen Sie meine Unternehmens-ID aus dem Dropdown menü aus. But when any of the other conditions are selected, the German translation looks like this. And you can easily see that this is wrong. The dash and the genitive S are displayed and the English terms entity ID and type slash value also show up. And the problem with this is the translator has no chance of doing anything about it. Here, for example, is another sentence in which the author has used conditions to account for different models, the DM model and the DEXF7 model, and for singular and plural. So this is a really complex sentence with two different conditions in several places of the sentences. But again, what the translator sees in the CAT tool just looks like this. Really, really, um, yeah, frustrating. Translating a sentence like this in such a way that it displays grammatically correct in every possible output is the absolute and ultimate challenge for a translator. It would have been much better if the author had constructed two different sentences and applied only one condition to each of the sentence. So we are handling a lot of flare projects that have been built in a very sophisticated and complex manner. And I really, really take my head off to the people who are able to do that using variables, conditions, and snippets in such a way that it saves you time and the work is definitely great. And it, to me, it always shows how much brain work people put in their, into their projects. And it's all great as long as you don't need to have it translated. So what can you do as the author in order to make your documents kind of translation proof? My first and most important recommendation would be just kiss meaning keep it super simple. And here are some general rules that you can follow. Uh, number one, only use variables for brand names, product names, or names in general. And of course, for numbers or any non-textual information. Please never use them for generic terms, such as device or machine or instruction manual. Number two, if you need to have multiple variants of a sentence in a project that may change depending on conditions, then don't put all the conditions into one sentence, but instead write out complete sentences and assign them the required conditions. That way, you will certainly not end up with bad surprises when you compare. And number three, do not use snippets in partial sentences. Always remember, the more complex your sentences are in terms of variables, conditions, and snippets, the higher the chances that you need to invest more money and energy into correcting them after translation than what you gain in the first place by using them. And here's a little tip. If you happen to speak a second language, then try to find out how Transla translating a sentence with a lot of variables and conditions would work in that other language. Now, somebody might say, if I write two or more complete sentences instead of creating one sentence that covers all my output needs, I will end up paying more for translation. Well, this may or may not be true depending on their project. But from my experience, it's definitely worth it if you consider all the potential threats and all the potential necessary rework that you might face when you end up with wrong translations. So 
Remember, don't apply more than one condition tag to a single sentence. If you need to vary the tags within a sentence, rather create two sentences and tag each sentence for the output it goes with, with the corresponding condition. Now, let's move on to the next topic, special formatting. This is not so much of an issue when your output is HTML or web only, but it can be for PDF output. When writing your content for PDF output, always have in mind the possible text expansions in, other, in various other languages. Some languages can be shorter, such as uh, Japanese or Chinese, but others can be considerably longer, sometimes up to 30 or 50 percent. So this means you will most likely need to fix formatting for page breaks, text in tables or columns, and so on. Here's an example. The customer of this project created a nice frame in the page layout file for the beginning of each new chapter to hold the header one text. This is what it looks like in Flare, and this is what the output looks like in the PDF file. So you can see that the header nicely fits within that frame. But after translation into French, this is what the PDF looks like. It's not just the part of the header one text ended up outside the frame, but part of the following text was also moved to the next page. We did this translation into several languages, and we only discovered this problem after translation and right before we had to deliver the project. So we had to go manually through all the PDF pages in all languages to look for problems and then go back into Flare and either shorten the translation or find some other solution to fix this because we could not generally increase the size of the frame or reduce the size of, of the font because both solutions would have caused other problems. So if you create PDF output from your translated Flare projects, it would be a good idea to ask your translator to do what we call a pseudo translation before starting the actual translation work. And that pseudo translation should comprise a text expansion of at least 30%. This can help you find any parts in your documentation that may cause potential problems after translation. By considering this right upfront during your content creation, you might be able to eliminate problems at a later stage when the pressure is high due to a short time publication date. Here's another little thing that you might want to consider when you need to translate your project into a right to left language like Arabic or Hebrew, you should be careful with the icons that you are using. Um, here's an example that shows quite well what I mean. In this document, the author used that finger icon to mark the note paragraphs. Now, when you have to translate this project into Hebrew, for example, you will run into problems with that icon because it will point into the wrong direction, of course. This means you need to redo all direction related icons. In this case, we could not simply flip the image because then the index finger would have been on the top or on the bottom of the hand instead of at the top. So we had to mirror the icon so that the index finger was at the correct place. So this picture shows the left to right, the correct left to right, and down here the correct right to left uh, image. So in the end, the Hebrew text must look like this, the finger pointing in the right direction. So remember, if you are translating into a right to left language, avoid using direction related icons that need to be changed after translation. Now, here's another very important thing to consider when it comes to formatting. Always use CSS styles instead of local formatting or inline styles. A very famous man once said, and I quote, in a madcap flare authoring environment, inline formatting, for example, highlighting a word in the editor and using the keys control B to make the text bold is downright evil, nasty, and, and mean. It is like a hit of a crack cocaine. It may serve the immediate need, but will cause you nothing but trouble for the remaining life of the document. 
Most of you probably know this guy. It's Mike Hamilton from Madcap Software. And what Mike says here is absolutely true. And it's even more true when you have your Flare projects translated. As I said at the beginning, translating a Flare project is like copying it. And every problem that is in the source text gets copied into the translated projects. So if you need to make changes or corrections to your inline formattings, you don't have to do it just in one project, but in as many projects as, as you translate into. We have compiled a ton of things that we came across in all the different Flare projects that we translated in the past. But if you just remember some of those things that I just mentioned, you can avoid, I would say, about 70 to 80 percent of all the problems. Now, let's move quickly on to our next topic. What is the best way to prepare graphics with text for translation? Generally speaking, you should always try to avoid using images that contain any kind of text that needs to be translated. There are nice workarounds for this, like tables, numbered or bulleted lists, um, and that kind. However, if you do have to add text to your images, then you should consider using Madcap Capture. In my opinion, this is the best, and as far as I know, only tool of its kind that automatically writes all call out text into easily translatable XML files. So when you send a Flare project off for translation and you have your images, you, when you have images that contain text, which you have entered with Madcap Capture, you don't need to worry about those images anymore. Because every decently equipped and experienced, experienced translator will be able to pull the XML files with the text callouts into the translation memory and translate them. So that when you receive the translated Flare project back, all your images will be translated as well. Here's another topic I want to discuss with you quickly because we often see people struggle with it. What is the best way? to include UI strings in your online documentation? Many authors have a hard time answering this question. And usually what they do is they just retype the required UI strings into their online help documentation. Sometimes they mark the UI strings with a special formatting or a special tag to make them better visible or stand out. And both things definitely are great and they definitely help the translator. But I think here's a better way of doing that. Ideally, your developers should be able to pull the UI strings from the application that you describe in your Flare project. Those UI strings may have been translated already, so you should be able to get a hold of the UI strings in the source language and in all the target languages, probably in an Excel or CSV or XML or XLIF format. And from these files, it is relatively easy to migrate the strings into a variables file or convert them into snippets in Flare. And then in the actual online help, you never type out the UI strings, but simply insert the relevant strings as a variable or a snippet. And by the way, if you don't know how to migrate, migrate the UI strings quickly and painlessly into variables or snippets, you may want to contact somebody from Mad Skills. Those guys will certainly be able to help you with that. You can even do it outside of Flare and maybe create a little script that will automatically create those snippets and name them according to the desired naming schema. There's just one thing that you should um, be aware when you use variables, um, you can't apply any formatting to your UI string. So if you want any special formatting to apply it, then you should probably better go with, um, with the snippets. Now, why should you do that? What advantages do you get from importing UI strings into variables or snippets? Number one, you are less likely to create typos when inserting the UI strings. It is the strings in your online help match exactly the strings as they appear to the software use. This is a thing that we quite often see in uh, when, when we translate uh, online help, for example, that sometimes the UI strings uh, entered in the online help do not really match other strings as they appear in the, in the software. Uh, advantage number two is that translating those individual variables or snippets for the on help is much easier and more precise than when they appear within a sentence, since the translation memory will get you a spotless 100% match. 
Number three, UI strings inserted as snippets or variables do not appear as words. So they will not add to the word count that you have to pay for, which will save you money in translation. And number four, managing different languages with this approach is extremely easy. And finally, changing individual UI strings in your project is very easy as well. Well, um, I think it's time now to recap what we have been talking about so far. What is it that you as the author of a Flare project can do to make sure every translation runs as smoothly as possible? Number one, make sure the project that you send to your translator is complete and contains no errors. Number two, snippets, variables, and conditions. Please use them wisely and don't overdo it with them. If you happen to speak a second language other than the one you're authoring your content in, try to figure out if translating a sentence with conditions and variables would work in that other language. And as a general rule, try to keep your sentences as simple as possible. And if in doubt, rather create uh, two sentences or more sentences with different conditions and variables instead of pushing everything into just one sentence. If you are publishing print or PDF output, then try to keep your layout as simple as possible and reserve enough text, enough space for any text expansion. This will keep any layout work to a minimum. And also, if you can avoid it, refrain from squeezing text into text boxes. They may look good, but will probably cause problems with some languages. And as I said before, it might also be a good idea to ask your translator to do a pseudo translation with some text expansion to find out any potential problems up front before the pressure of a tight deadline starts to build. Um, number four, we talked about images. Um, try to use images and graphics without text, rather use bulleted or numbered lists or tables. And if you do have to put text into graphics, consider using Madcap Capture for creating the call out so that all translatable text is contained in easy to translate XML files. And finally, we talked about the UI strings. Um, here's a suggestion, pull UI strings into variables or snippets, whatever works best for you. And doing this right will help you get better translation results and reduce your translation costs. Now, at the beginning, I said I would skip the first and most important point and only mention it at the very end. And here we are. After we have looked at some of the potential challenges that can come up when translating Flare projects, I think we all now realize how complex Flare projects and single source publishing projects in general can be. Even experienced translators or project managers who usually prepare a project for the translators can have a hard time figuring out what is going on in a specific Flare project, let alone translators who have no experience with Flare at all. And therefore, I would consider the following advice as the absolutely most important. Talk to your translator. I think I cannot overstress this how important it is. Take the time to sit down with your translator and explain the structure of your FLIR project, what files it contains, where they are, what variables and conditions you use and how you use them, how you use snippets, what targets you need and so on. This is really, really important. And believe me, the time you spend here is well spent. It will most likely save you from unpleasant surprises and expensive rework. So I think that's it for today's webinar. I hope there was something in this presentation that will help you improve your next experience when translating your Flare projects. If you have any questions regarding these topics, I'll be very glad to answer them if I can. Thank you very much. So Jen, may I hand Thank over you. to you?
Yes, please. Thank you, Myra. That was that was great presentation. Uh, I just want to remind everybody um, just to we have some great questions that are coming in and take a moment. If you have any questions for Myra, feel free to jot them down. We're going to try and get to some as you come in. Um, I want to remind everybody that our, our conference is coming up in a couple months. So I think, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, Mad World San Diego, April 14th through the 17th. Um, just to remind everybody that's on, you still have a chance to register and save on that registration. Uh, through March 15th, and this will be uh, clickable in the slides that you receive, and of course, this is available on our website. And the last thing, too, just letting everybody know, MAD Translations is, is our language service provider uh, arm of our company, and if, if any of you have questions or if you're embarking on this translation process for the first time or perhaps you want to make sure your process is optimized or interested in perhaps a competitive quote, please reach out. Uh, again, you can't click on this right now, but when you receive the follow-up slides, you know, you'll be able to click on that to get a quote. Um, as Meinrad said, we always like to analyze what you've got going on and see how we can help. Um, and there's no there's no charge for that for that quote. You'll also right. be able to contact us on our website. Yeah, so we really want to take a look at everything first before we make recommendations, but our team is happy to assist with that whole process because it's a um, it's it's an important part of the documentation delivery workflow and we want to make sure we we help you get it right um, so definitely reach out if you have questions now I, I want to just get to a few questions that have come in because I think there were some good ones here um, you I, I want to repeat this you, you did talk about this mine red but I think it's a great question I think it's worth talking about again uh, the question is you said to be careful about using common nouns as variables are proper <laughs> nouns such as company names normally safe to leave as unflattened variables and and I I, re, I know you talked about that but I think it's a yes. good one to talk about and, and repeat uh, for yes. everybody yes. Uh, any any words that don't need to be grammatically adjusted like you would never adjust a, a company name for example um, those are safe to use in unflattened variables but any general words like as I said manual or I mean people even write um, half sentences in in variables um, and this this uh, gets really messy then in translation so yes uh, company names are safe product names are safe uh, usually except for well um, there might be some languages uh, where even product names need to be grammatically adjusted so you should talk to your translator as, as i said talking to your translator is so so important uh, before um, you, you never know what what problems you run into. So depending on the languages you translate into, talk to the translators and tell them, see here, th these are the variables that we use in the project. And do you see any problems with them in, in, in the translation, let's say into Finnish or uh, uh, Russian or whatever? Great. And then just a kind of a follow up on that, um, uh, just a point of clarification, there was a follow up question about you were talking about UI, uh, UI strings as, as variables. So as a follow up, you know, UI strings often contain common nouns or verbs. How do you reconcile these two principles with the mention of using UI strings as variables? Um, typically, when you use a UI string in a documentation, you refer to something that the reader sees on that the software user sees on the screen so um, basically if you have just the word menu or um, a dialogue uh, then this is it always should appear in the way that that it appears in the software so it should not be necessary to grammatically adjust those words um, i think I, I do know that sometimes um, Structuring your sentence around those very short UI strings can help avoid those problems as well. I mean, if you have long UI strings, then you don't run into these uh, problems. But with short, short words that you use and that you integrate into your sentence, that can, of course, be a problem. Um, but again, it's it's always I think it's always important to think about uh, problems in the in, in the translation right when you author your content. Um, so I think it's important to it, it helps if you structure the sentence so that um, and usually people who author content they have a good command of the language and most most people are bilingual. So um, 
if you happen to be bilingual and then they try to figure out what this sentence, um, how this sentence would translate in a, in a different language and if you would need to uh, adjust this word um, grammatically. Great. Uh, another good question with screenshots, I know you touched on this, but again, I think it would be good to repeat for everyone. Any suggestions for dealing with screenshots of user interfaces with text? I usually have to take a screenshot of the screen in each language. Uh, yeah, um, sure. I don't have a solution for that. That's a lot of work, I know, and you, you, you just have to do that. I think I don't know any faster way or any any tool that could help you uh, do that more quickly. Yeah, and, and well, I believe there there may be some things depending on the use of lingo, and and I don't want to speak out of turn, but there there may be some ways to batch, you know, swap out at least ma manage the swapping of those images easily. Yeah, um, that's sure. That's another thing. I mean, I was. Uh, I, I thought the question was about taking the screenshots. Yeah, we, it is. Of course, we have to take the screenshots for every for all the languages that you translate into. But uh, in in Flare, actually, it um, it makes sense to use the same names for all the screenshots in all languages, and then you can just swap uh, or exchange the screenshots for the different languages in the Flare project, and the references are still there. And then instead of the English screenshot. Uh, the German screenshot, for example, is displayed in the German Flare project. Great. Okay, let me just see here. We have a couple other questions coming in. How can one manage indentation on a paragraph in a translation, in Chinese, for example, when the source is in English without indentation? Mm, that's a tricky question. Um, this one I really can't uh, answer from the top of my head. I would have to follow up on that okay. and talk to my team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, there lots of great questions coming in and we may not be able to get to them all, but just rest assured, keep asking because we'll make sure to send a follow-up uh, document to everybody. Yes, yes. Um, so here's an interesting question. How will this, uh, talking about the saved word count, um, isn't it true that once a UI name is translated, it doesn't matter how many occurrences there are of it because it's already been translated? Uh, um, that's, that's a general misconception that we often see. Um, when you do an analysis, when you run an analysis in a CAT tool, uh, the analysis, well, it's based on the word count, but the analysis is always based on a sentence. So it, it's, um, the, the tool does not count how often a certain word appears that has been translated, but how it, it's always based on a sentence, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a huge difference. Okay. So if a sentence uh, has a different, contains a different word, then it's no longer a 100% match. Um, but it's different if you use a variable for, let's say um, you have a sentence that says, this is the help menu in my project. Um, so if you import the help menu, for example, into a variable, and then you exchange the content of the variable for something else, then the uh, the sentence will probably still be a 100% match, depending on the settings that you have in the CAT tool. But that saves you definitely a lot of um, a lot of can save you a lot of money actually. Okay, great. Here's an interesting question: If you use if you use Lingo and your translator does not use Flare, how do you recommend that the overall document be be checked? If the translator uses Lingo and not Flare, right? I believe so. And perhaps for the, uh, yes, yeah, so for the person who asked the question, it was specifically the question was, if you use Lingo and your translator does not use Flare, how does he recommend that the overall document be checked? Maybe rephrase that perhaps a little bit just to clarify the question there on, on who's using what. Uh, that may be helpful. Um, yeah. Um, and, and we can go I mean, back. We, 
we we have seen that it's a problem if your translator doesn't use flair and doesn't know flair because it's really important that after the translation process um, the translator is able to build the output that the customer has ordered and check the output if the translator is only able to send back uh, maybe the translated topics uh, or maybe even just the translated excel files um, then you as the author, you as the customer, you, you will have to build the output and uh, check it again, maybe send the output back to the translator. Um, so if your translator is able to do that right in one step, it saves you and the translator a lot of uh, time and work actually. Right. So if they don't have those tools, then then the author is responsible for generating the output, sending it over to the translator, yes. perhaps somebody internally who's knowledgeable in that language and subject matter to check it. Yeah, and what we've seen is that uh, sometimes you run into problems um, if you don't have a good understanding, a, a good knowledge of how Flair works, then for, it, for an external translator, it's sometimes really easy to uh, recommend um, a, a viable solution to, to a problem that appeared. So again, you as the author would be responsible for dealing with that problem and you probably can't count on the help of your translator then. So I, I would really recommend uh, to find translators who know Flair and who have experience with using Flair. Okay, so here's an interesting question on, on machine translation. Can you please tell me if Google machine translation works well with Lingo? Yes, I think Google does. Um, and uh, whether it works well or not depends on um, the language and the source text uh, with machine translation. Um, Google has improved considerably over the past few years and it's really gives you good output meanwhile um, but yeah i think i know it it uh, lingo supports google and you can you should be able to use it right but again as i said uh, the quality of the output heavily depends on the quality of the source text so be aware of that right and just uh, my own follow-up question to that do you often find mine rad that it's a good uh, uh, machine translation is a, a first pass at, at things, I mean, I, I would assume that it doesn't necessarily replace the human element of the translation workflow. Yes, yes, that's that's correct. Okay. Um, when I talk about pseudo translation, um, you can do it with machine translation, for example. You can uh, push your content or your project through Google Translate or Debell or whatever. Um, what we usually do is we replace all the regular text with um, with characters that usually don't appear in the text, like uh, dashes, for example. Um, and uh, then we configure the text expansion. So by doing that, it is very, very easy for us to catch any um, spots that can cause problems, like where the text is too long, for example, or even to catch uh, parts of a Flare project that haven't been pulled from Lingo maybe because the target wasn't set correctly or some conditions weren't applied correctly. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes, yeah, that, that's, a, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, and for, so for the, hopefully that helped the person that asked and, and please send a follow-up if, if we need to clarify. Sure. Um, good question. I think we have time for maybe one or, one or two more. This is a good one that came up, I think, from when you were talking about um, styles and the importance of using CSS and, and not local formatting. Um, mm. and, and just to kind of clarify something here. So the question is, just want to confirm, if you, if you need to bold UI terms in your content, you need to use snippets instead of variables because variables do not support formatting. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct, yes. Right, um, but I think beyond that too, perhaps to clarify um, that you can still use the CSS formatting within your snippet. Um, but I, I think right, the snippet's yeah. great for content that does need to be formatted. And within that snippet, it's good to use your CSS to, to bold elements or to put an emphasis on on, on text rather than doing that control B exercise. Yeah, right. Right. 
That was an interesting question too. I think we have time for maybe one more here. If you don't flatten your snippets, I assume the translator will have trouble translating in context. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Great. Um, well, I mean, yeah. it's, it's always important that you give your translator a reference file. So if, for example, the, the, the final PDF of the target that the translator has to translate. And um, just a general uh, thing, um, a PDF file is still much, much better to handle for a translator than an HTML output. It's much easier to find the required text. You, the thing is, when you translate a Flare project in a CAD tool, usually you don't go from the beginning to the very end, but you have a random list of files. You may have some some uh, folder structure in it, but you usually it's it's sometimes hard for a translator to know where in the whole document he or she is actually currently translating. So they always have to look up the text in the reference file in the PDF or in the in the online help. And uh, using a PDF as a reference is is much better for a translator than sending a translator an, an HTML output. Great. We're, we're just approaching the end of the hour here, and we do have some more questions coming in. We're, I'd encourage you to jot down a few last minute ones here. There, there are a few we didn't get to, and some that we're going to have some follow up on. So um, we'll, we'll be sure to compile all that and get MindRed's advice and, and get it sent out to everybody so you have a good reference. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we'll be sure to get all of that out to you. So, Myron, thanks so much for taking the time with us today. Um, for everyone on the call, I hope you found this useful. We'd love to get your feedback on this. And I, I hope this sheds some light on, on some of the workflow. And um, I, I, we hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Uh, and Myron, thanks again for taking the time with us today. And we'll, we'll talk to you all yeah. soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys, for attending. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye.